Sometimes I get the urge to just go out there and chop away at something. And very often when you think of chopping, well, you think of an axe. But if you're a sword guy like me, an axe doesn't always cut it. So that's where the falchion comes in, because a falchion blends the chopping power of an axe with the look and feel of a sword. We're going to take a look at one such falchion today, the windless falchion. Although not sided by Windlass, the design for this falchion is heavily inspired by the Thorpe falchion, an iron sword that was discovered in the River Yar at Thorpe St. Andrews in 1833. One of only about a dozen historical falchions to have survived, the Thorpe falchion is perhaps the best preserved. Although its prevalence in medieval art testifies to its popularity, very few original falchions still exist. This rarity of surviving specimens may be more proof of its popularity. Most of the falchions were used up in battle. While the double-edged sword gets most of the press, the single-edged falchion was favored by many great knights and men-at-arms. The wide cutting blade was quite effective against mail. Although armor was being improved by the addition of plates, only the very wealthy could afford it. Although the falchion was intended primarily to be a cutting weapon, the development of the point was not ignored. This example has a very strong point that would penetrate mail with a hard thrust or stab, a well-designed fighting weapon made by windless steel crafts. The blade is tempered high carbon steel, the guard and pommel are both steel, and the grip is wood covered in leather. This comes complete with a leather scabbard and can be sharpened for an additional fee. Here are the specifications of the windless falchion This falchion is a very, very basic design, aesthetically speaking. Uh, they didn't do a lot to really uh, capture the original they were going off of uh, beyond just the general profile. And you can tell there's kind of a quick implementation in this blade, and it shows in a lot of different regards. So I'm going to point those out. But first, I will say that, generally speaking, they did follow the, the design of the original for the most part. It has the silhouette. It, it looks like a good falchion. Um, but then when you look at the details, you begin to see where uh, things don't really necessarily keep up appearances as well as they should. Uh, to start that, I'll actually note this also in the functionality section, but the back spine uh, really is just, it's the same thickness throughout, so there's no distal taper. And uh, from a visual standpoint, that really makes this look like it was just punched out of a big bar of steel. And I would have liked to have seen a little bit more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Finesse. And I'll probably use that word a lot in this review, but there's really no finesse in the implementation of this blade. There's also a significant gap. Uh, between the blade and the cross guard, very, very common in Lilith products as always. I will note that as something that I would like to see actually closed up and more finely fitted. Uh, some of the problems I have with this uh, particular design or this particular implement implementation is actually where they punched out the little cross designs in the cross guard. Uh, they are uneven in their, um, in their implementation. So one is a little bit fatter, looks a little bit thicker than the other. And the other one seems to be more finely put in there. So there was no real evenness. You could tell it was just kind of punched out real quick. And there isn't a lot there to, to kind of make them uh, look similar. Uh, so that's a little bit jarring when you're paying really close attention, but from afar, it's not too bad. Uh, because the pommel itself is threaded, there is no peen, so the pommel looks very smooth, very pretty. Uh, that is, of course, then a sacrifice because it is threaded, as I'll get to later. Um, the implementation of the fuller, I thought, looked a little bit hurried. You can tell you just kind of ground it into the blade without a lot of thought of cleaning it up. Um, it's not bad, it just isn't the greatest looking thing, and it does have a few spots of unevenness in it. But again, overall, the profile is following that of the Thorpe falchion, and uh, they did a really good job of capturing that, uh, to the point where I really wish they'd actually cited it more as a source, since they basically cited nothing. And they are, you know, windless sells through museum replicas, it is a museum piece, they're replicating it. Why not actually claim that? I don't really know, but there is definitely that heavy inspiration, and it looks 
uh, really nice. Again, it's very simple, very basic, and that's not a bad thing in a sword. In fact, I've always said that I actually prefer simplicity. So this is one of those cases where I actually kind of prefer the simplistic design in the Falchion, although I wish some of the details were better implemented. Where to begin? Um, I have so many thoughts in my head about the functionality of this sword that it's kind of hard to make them cohesive and really speak to it in an organized manner. Uh, what, I, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to kind of give the positive view of it first and talk about all the negatives because I, I really feel that there's a very, very odd balance between those two. Uh, the positives are this works really well as a cutter. Um, it came sharpened, or I had it sharpened, I paid a little bit extra to go ahead and get Winless to sharpen it for me. Uh, this was probably the sharpest they have ever sent me a sword. It was incredibly sharp, razor sharp, and I don't really very often use that term when I talk about swords, but it really is there. You could shave with this thing. Um, and it chops really well. Uh, in my cut tests, I had no problems with it. It got straight through the tatami. Uh, I was very surprised by that, but at the same time, I'm not because that's actually the point of these types of swords is to have that cutting power. Uh, I was just surprised by how easy it was compared to my previous efforts. I like it. So uh, really, really very good chopper. It works very well in cutting. Thrusting, uh, I didn't really test thrusting. Despite what Windless says, uh, the thrusting on Falchions is not really the point. Um, pardon the pun, but yeah, it, it, it is sharp. You can thrust with it, and certainly if you're using it from a historical context, you would use that point to kind of harry your opponent and, and keep them at bay uh, in certain stances. But really, this sword is ma made mostly for cutting. And that's where this begins to now uh, falter a bit, because... Uh, the implementation of this from a cutting perspective has a few concerning elements. Now the gap, I've noted before in other functionality reviews, the bigger the gap, the more concern I would have with this end up becoming loose. This is a screw uh, threaded pommel, and so uh, yeah, you could retighten it, but it's a wheel pommel. So when you retighten a wheel pommel, now the pommel is off. Uh, Really, when I see a wheel pommel, I like for it to be peened. I like to know that it's really in there firm and it's not going to have to shift. Uh, and the only time I'm really ever happy with a threaded pommel is when it is uh, symmetric all the way around, right? It's volumetrically symmetrical. Uh, and what that means is that, you know, there's symmetry here, but there's, uh, there's not symmetry around. So if I had to bend this now, it's all crooked. Um, implementation of the falchion from the from the perspective of a usable uh, sword from a historical context, this one really begins to fail. And, and where I don't get that is that they had a good historical model to go off of and they obviously used it, but then they ignored some really key features. And I think that that is very telling about how quickly they wanted to get this out to market because they didn't really pay a lot of close attention. One of these is in the distal taper. Uh, because there is no real distal taper from uh, the strong to the weak of the blade, uh, it's got a lot of extra weight. Now the original in the museum is right around two pounds. Uh, this comes in uh, about 12 ounces heavier than that. I don't know what that is in kilograms, I apologize. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's significantly heavier than the historical model would have been. Now, of course, there's a little bit of degrading on the historical model, so the weight they have might have changed a bit, um, but certainly not 12 ounces worth, not almost a full pound. And uh, a lot of that weight could have been shaved off of this by having a good distal taper. Uh, another place where the weight could have been taken off, as well as making this a uh, more historically valid uh, sword, is having this back uh, false edge here near the tip sharpened, because it should have been and it would have been. Um, the fact this is thick and very, 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 very blunt um, is problematic. And, and unfortunately, because of the way they implemented this to sharpen this, would take a lot of effort to really bring this down to the right bevel and get it sharpened down to that point. I don't know that I care as much for this cheaper version of a sword to actually worry about that. If I really cared that much for a good historical model, I'll go for a more expensive, a better implemented sword. But that's a really key feature of a falchion. Uh, and you'll see this a lot in historical manuals. Generally speaking, historical manuals speak more to 
um, gross messers, right? The, the large knife, as it were called. Uh, and a messer and a falchion are not really all that different from a fighting standpoint. They, they should be very, very similar. And using that false edge in a cut, uh, in kind of a quick defensive cut, as well as again to harry your opponent, even if it's not going to be the most effective cut, um, it, it can be effective enough. And plenty of treaties speak to that, and they, they show that in their images, having that false edge cut. So to not have that in this version seems like a massive oversight to me. So I'm very, very disappointed in that. Uh, otherwise, functionality, it, it, it's, it's perfectly fine. It works, again, well as a chopper. So if you're going to go out there and chop just kind of away, uh, almost like a machete, this will work. It'll do just fine. Even though it is a little bit heavier, it's not too bad. The weight uh, is pretty darn manageable, although, again, it's a lot heavier than it should be for such a short sword. Um, and so you will get a little bit tired uh, using it. But, yeah, it, it's it's good implementation. I. I my biggest concerns are the construction, specifically with the threaded pommel, uh, because especially when you got a, a weapon that you're doing a lot of kind of heavy chopping with, there's a lot of potential for all that to loosen. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you're kind of screwed in this one. Again, sorry the pun. Uh, sorry for the pun, because, well, the the screw pommel is not going to ever align properly again, and that's just very very disappointing. Uh, but again, it worked really well, it was perfectly sharp, and I was able to get out there and cut right through things. You can really feel the power of a falchion uh, using this sword, and I, I think it's very telling, if you've never had a chance to use one, just how different it really feels, and why this became so popular, especially among archers, which is actually, uh, a lot of uh, archers actually use it because it was short, it was uh, you know easily set to the side, um, but it was very, very effective against uh, most common foot soldiers. Uh, and you can definitely tell, boy, that this this works. It does the job, and and it definitely would work very very well for someone who is generally untrained in swordsmanship. Oh man, I am really torn on this sword. Uh, it, it's weird. Normally, I'm very confident in my reviews and the scores I would give. So when I go into a conclusion section, I, I'm. I'm gung-ho, I go right for it, and I know I know exactly what I want to say, but so much about this sword is like this strange balance between really good and really bad, because implementation-wise, there's just so many things that are poorly done, so many things that are shoddily done, and so many things that are done quickly, and, and it ignores historical models, even the one they base it on, but at the same time, I really like this sword, it's a lot of fun to cut with. Uh, not a lot of finesse is going to go into your cutting because it doesn't allow for, because it doesn't have a sharp false edge. You're not going to really uh, use it like in a historical model, but it, it is a lot of fun to cut with, and it works really well, and it is functional, and it's a good price. So you kind of got this weird teetering thing going because um, it really does just kind of barely skate that line, and I want to give it a better score than I probably end up will, uh, but it is what it is. Now there are some things that do come with this. Uh, you do get uh, the, the scabbard. Um, typical notes on a windless scabbard apply. If this is my first time, or your first time ever viewing one of my videos, uh, my general notes on a windless scabbard are they're terrible. They barely function as a scabbard. They, they meet the bare minimum re uh, requirements. This one is leather, it has no wood core, uh, and it's very, very um, plain implementation. So it's really nothing more than to stick uh, you know, a frog onto, put it on a belt, and put the sword in and carry it around. Uh, not a lot to speak to on the scabbard. Again, the sword itself, um, the specific drawbacks in my opinion are the construction, specifically that it has a wheel pommel that is not peened, so because it's a threaded pommel that means that if I ever have to retighten it, now it looks all crooked, that's problematic. Um, there isn't a lot to say about the grip, the, con the construction in terms of uh, the tightness between the blade and the cross guard is typical windless fashion. Very large gap, I'd like to see that closed. The uh, distal taper, yet again, big problem in my opinion. And probably the biggest drawback, of course, is uh, the lack of sharpening on the false edge right here on this curved bit, the concave pit near uh, part near the tip. Um, and so all those things together, you can tell that, uh, even from a windless perspective, uh, this is kind of a rushed product. There isn't a lot to it that um, has quite the, the good level of design, thought, or implementation put into it uh, that you might see in some other windless swords. So even though you know, windless as, as a sword company uh, tends to put out um, mostly mediocre swords, but they, are, they do meet the functionality requirement, uh, 
they do come in at a good price. This comes in at a good price. I'd buy it again in a heartbeat. So that says a lot about how much I enjoy it. But at the same time, I really wish they had spent a little bit more time on it. They could have increased the price a bit, just spent a little bit more time on it, fix the problems, and have a much better falchion. Now, maybe they've done that with the hot and falchion, which I don't have. Um, maybe there are some things fixed there. I, I'd have to go review one. Um, but this one, as it stands, it's mediocre. It doesn't really excel, but it also isn't so bad that I would just trash it. So here it is. This is the Windless Falchion. I give it a 3 out of 5.